So you may have heard this song on TikTok. Quite frankly, I don't know what the writer of this song was thinking, but, but he made a masterpiece. What's up, Wildlife? My name is Johnny, and if we haven't had the chance to meet, I'm the middle school director here of Wildlife here at the Church of Rocky Peak, and right now we're about to go into a time of teaching, so I want to encourage you, go ahead and grab those note sheets you guys can either get on our website, rockypeak.org, or from an email you guys should have gotten earlier this week. But let's go ahead and jump on in with a time of prayer. Father, thank you so much. We have an opportunity right now to come before you. Um, I ask that your presence would be um, wherever this person is watching this video, whether it's at their kitchen counter, whether it's in their bedroom, uh, their closet, their backyard, wherever they're at. I just pray that you would be with them and that you would speak very loudly, very boldly in this time. I pray for myself as the communicator that I would become so much less and that you as Jesus would become so much more, that you would be the focus of this time. We love you and we just thank you so much for an opportunity to come before you in this time. We love you, and in your name, amen. So I remember when I was in fifth grade, transitioning into sixth grade, and for any sixth grader right now, you just did that. As you guys just started school, you just transitioned from elementary into middle school. And to all the seventh and eighth graders, you can relate to me this, uh, relate to me in the same way as well. But when I was going into fifth grade, going uh, when I was coming from fifth grade, going into sixth grade, it was honestly a pretty hard time for me. It was pretty challenging. And the main reason for that is one, I was going to a private school in elementary school, and then I was going now into public school, into middle school. And it was a really hard time for me for one main reason, bullying. I was bullied pretty severely, maybe not as much as other kids during that time, but I was bullied pretty harshly when I was going into sixth grade. For example, I knew no one going to this new school. I knew no one at all, and I felt so alone and isolated. And maybe you guys can relate to that when you went to a new school or whatever. I know all of you are doing online school right now, so it's maybe not entirely uh, in the same way, but you could probably probably relate to me in the same way that when you went from a new school or a new experience, you might feel kind of isolated and maybe just alone. And when I went into sixth grade, I was pretty uh, isolated and I felt so alone, like no one else knew me. And I was bullied pretty harshly when I was going into sixth grade. For example, I was bullied just for being the new kid. I was bullied because I was a new kid and everyone else didn't know me, so they thought they could just pick on me. And I remember specifically, I still remember this to this day, when I was in sixth grade in PE class, I was uh, bullied in the way of kids would start throwing rocks at me. And I know you're probably thinking like, wow, that's really harsh. And uh, it really was. And I don't know why I was uh, having rocks thrown at me or anything, but I remember I was just so isolated and alone and I was being bullied just because I was the new kid. And also a lot of people knew I was a Christian and people would bully me because they thought that I was better than them. But in reality, I wasn't, but I was still being bullied because of that. But here's the reality, bullying looks so much, so much more different than it did when I was in middle school. Now today we have something called cyberbullying, and in our culture today, cyberbullying is enormous. It is so big, way bigger than any type of bullying that we've ever had in our culture before. And right now in this video for this week, we are gonna be continuing our series, I See You, and we are gonna be talking about specifically cyberbullying and how our culture has such a big part in that. And really, we're gonna identify what cyberbullying is and also what does Jesus have to say about it, as well as how as Christians, how are we to treat other people. Now before we move on going and talking about cyberbullying and identifying what it really is, I want to read our passage that we learned uh, that we've been reading the past couple weeks from Ephesians chapter 2 starting at verse 10. So it says this, for we are God's handiwork. Remember we are his poema. God created us and he created us in Christ Jesus to do good works which uh, God prepared in advance for us to do. So in this series, we've been looking at what uh, the internet is, how are we supposed to go about social media, and what does Jesus have to say about it? And for the past couple of weeks, we learned that is social media okay? 
Yes, it's okay. And last week we learned about motives and learned that everything we should do should be glorifying to God and that we shouldn't be thinking about ourselves but thinking of other people more. That we should be humble and not think about ourselves before other people. But this week we're going to again talk about cyberbullying. And I want to define what cyberbullying is. It's going to be on your screen. But here's what cyberbullying is from stopbullying.gov, which is a government uh, site talking about cyberbullying and all that sort of stuff. But here's the definition. Cyberbullying is bullying that takes place over digital devices like cell phones, computers, and, uh, and tablets. Cyberbullying can occur through SMS, text, and apps, or online and social media forums, or gaming where people can view, participate in, or share content. So that's what cyberbullying is. It's pretty much just bullying, but in an online format. And cyberbullying can take many different forms. For example, you can send mean messages or threats to a person's email account or through a cell phone. You could be spreading rumors online or through text messages. You could be posting harmful or threatening messages on social media or uh, on the internet. You could be stealing a person's uh, personal information or to break into their account and then start sending damaging uh, messages to them. Another one is you could be pretending to be someone else online uh, in order to hurt another person, in another way, stealing their identity. Another one is uh, taking ugly pictures of a person and spreading them through their cell phone or the internet. And lastly, this is just another way, uh, is that you could be uh, sexting, sexting or passing sexual suggestive uh, pictures or messages about a person. We can see here that cyberbullying can take many different forms. But cyberbullying can be so damaging uh, to both youth and teenagers that it can start causing, uh, it can start causing anxiety, it can start call, uh, causing depression, or even suicide. And here's the reality, once something is on the internet, it is nearly impossible to take it down from the internet. That's how strong the internet is. But here's the thing, most people that are cyber bullies, which they bully people on the internet or social media, the, real, uh, the realization of why they do this is honestly that they think they're being funny. They think that what they're doing is funny and they never realize the consequences of what they're doing in the process of it. Now, before we continue, I wanna share some stats, some facts, if you will, of cyberbullying so you and I are both aware of how big of an impact this is. And then later, we're gonna go into a Bible passage, a passage of the Bible of talking about how are we as Christians to treat other people. And even if you don't consider yourself a Christian, which means you haven't accepted Jesus into your life, how are we supposed to treat other people? How are we supposed to be against our culture's way of living? But let's go right into uh, some facts about cyberbullying and so on. So here's the first one. Over half of teenagers and teens have been bullied online and about the same number have engaged in cyberbullying. More than one in three young people have experienced cyber threats online. Over 25% of youth and teens have been bullied repeatedly through their cell phones or the internet. Over 25%. Well over half of young people do not tell their parents when cyber bullying occurs. That's crazy. And then going on, another one is one in 10 teens tell a parent if they have been a victim of cyber bullying. So one in 10 will actually tell an adult. Another one is one in 10 youths or teens have, been, uh, have had embarrassing or damaging pictures taken of them without their permission, often using cell phones. About one in five teens have posted or sent sexual suggestive or nude pictures of themselves to others. One in five. Girls are somewhat more likely than boys to be involved in cyberbullying. Going on, about half of young people have experienced some form of cyberbullying, and 10 to 20% experience it regularly. Mean, hurtful comments and spreading rumors are often the most common type of cyberbullying. And cyberbullying victims are more likely to have low self esteem and consider suicide. Now, I know that was just a lot of facts that I shared with you right now, but my whole point with that is I wanted to show you guys how big of a deal and how impactful cyberbullying and bullying as a whole is in our culture. It's almost as if it's kind of normal. Like, well, yes, yeah, cyberbullying, bullying has always been around. It's just normal. 
But what we learned is that Jesus would always raise the bar. He would always say, hey, this is what you think. Let's raise the bar even more. But before we continue, I want to real quickly pause and give you two truths about cyberbullying and bullying as a whole. Again, it's going to be on your note sheets. Here's the first one. If you are being bullied or being made fun of, please tell someone. This is coming from me, Johnny. You guys know me. If you are a victim of being bullied by someone, being made fun of someone, and you're just, I don't know if I should tell someone, please tell someone. You can tell me, tell your parents, tell a teacher, tell someone if you are being bullied. Don't keep it in the dark. But here's the second truth. If you see someone being bullied, which means you're not being bullied, but you see maybe a friend or someone you never met before being bullied, if you see someone being bullied, stand up for them. But right now, let's go into our time of teaching into God's Word, and let's see real quickly, how does Jesus want us to treat other people, and how does Jesus show us how to be kind to other people? For example, in Matthew 5, Matthew chapter 5, starting at verse 43, it says this, You have heard it that it's been said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Another way of saying, uh, pray for those that maybe make fun of you for being a Christian, that uh, say harsh things because you love Jesus. See, Jesus' call in our lives is to glorify him in everything that we say and do. And that includes that we love and care for the people that make fun of us. And also that we are to then pray for them. But here's the reality. Here's the third truth on your note sheets. Loving our enemies is hard. Let's be honest. Loving our enemies is is hard. And praying for them is even harder. Now let me kind of help you understand what I mean by that, is that loving our enemies, it's hard sometimes. I know I've been there. Because often our enemies are maybe the ones that make fun of us, the ones that call us names, that, uh, that just tear us down. Loving them is so hard because if you're like me, you're like, why would I want to love on them and show them compassion and grace and mercy? Because they make fun of me. But in my opinion, what's even harder is praying for them. Because if you're like me, and this is like our sinful self, be like, Jesus, why would I want to love on them? Why would I want to pray for them? They hate me. They make fun of me. You have no idea, God, what they have put me through. But according to Matthew 5, verse 43, Jesus says, But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So right now, let's open up our Bibles to Luke chapter 10, starting at verse 25, and we're going to see a parable of Jesus. And again, from last week, we learned that a parable is a story that is easy to understand. But we're going to see right now that Jesus is about to teach us how to treat other people that may make fun of us, that may uh, call us names. How are we to treat those people? So we're going to open up to Luke chapter 10, starting at verse 25, and to give you guys some background of this book specifically, is that this book was written by a guy named Luke. And Luke was a doctor when he was writing this. So he's a really smart guy. But also the book of Luke is one of the gospels. One of the four gospels, we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So we're going to be in the second half of our Bibles, starting in Luke 10, starting at verse 25. So it says, The Parable of the Good Samaritan. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, What must I do to inherit eternal life? Verse 26, what is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? Again, this teacher of the law should know the law. And we're talking about the law of Moses, not, you know, buckling your seatbelt or anything, which is the first five books of our Bible. That's what the law, that's what he's talking about. And there's over 600 laws that, the, uh, that uh, Jewish people would live their life by, especially teachers of the law. So Jesus says, what is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? Verse 27, he answered, love, your Lord, uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied, do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Have you ever thought about that? Who is my neighbor? And I'm not just talking about the person, the family that lives next door to you. Who is your neighbor? Verse 30, in reply, Jesus said, A young man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked 
by robbers. Now, real quickly, there's going to be a picture somewhere on your screen, but Jerusalem to Jericho was a very rocky terrain. It was about 17 miles. So, for example, if we were to go from Rocky Peak to Six Flags Magic Mountain, that's about 20 miles from here to there. This person was traveling 17 miles, and it was very rocky terrain, very uh, huge amounts of hills and, and valleys and mountains, so very rocky terrain. So a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Verse 31, a priest happened to be going down the same road when he saw the man. He passed, uh, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place, saw him pass on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where this man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, which uh, was a way back then with how they would kind of disinfect, kind of take care of open wounds. Then he put the man on his donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, and denarii is just their form of, uh, of money. So for example, two denarii was kind of two full days of working. And it's funny, now today, if you were to convert that to U.S. dollars about, it's about it's about a dollar, which is not a lot here. But back then, that was two full wages of work. So he gave out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. What of these do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert of the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. So we can see here there are three characters in this part of scripture. There are three characters that we see. The first one being a priest, the second one being a Levite, and the third one being a Samaritan. And I want to kind of help you understand why these three characters are so important for us as people in 2020. So a priest is a, relig a religious leader of Israel, all right? So they were considered really holy people, and they would be considering God's people that would lead uh, his chosen people, Israel, uh, into uh, having them be closer to God. So think of like uh, a priest would be kind of like a middleman. So we have like normal people, a priest, and then God. And then for normal people to get to God, there would be a priest in between. So a priest would kind of be like a middleman. A Levite would be responsible for the priesthood uh, and the maintaining of the temple or the tabernacle, which is where God's presence would lie. So these two people were considered really holy and really close to God. But what we can see in this story is that they saw this, uh, this man that was wounded and, and, and beaten almost half to death. We saw that they saw him and then went on the other side and just kept on walking. But let's see the third character in the story, a Samaritan. Now, what you need to know about a Samaritan is that a Samaritan was a group of people that were half Jewish, just like the other two were. They were fully Jewish, but a Samaritan was half Jewish, half Gentile, all right? And what you need to understand is that a Samaritan was considered someone that they thought what they were doing was better than other Jewish people. All right, so for example, when Jesus was telling this parable to a group of people, a lot of people were uh, in the crowd were all Jewish, so they would know who a Samaritan was. And what you need to understand is that Jewish people hated Samaritans so much because they saw them less than other Jewish people. Because a Jewish person was fully Jewish, and a Samaritan person was half Jewish. So what you need to understand is that the Samaritan person in this parable, this story that it's easy to understand that Jesus is sharing, is the hero in the story. Not the priest who is really close to God, not the Levite who helps the priests and helps maintain the temple and the tabernacle where God resides. No, no, no. The Samaritan is the hero. And when every person, every Jewish person hearing this story I guarantee you guys that they got really upset and really uh, angry that the Samaritan was the hero in the story. But what we need to see here is that Jesus is telling us that the Samaritan who society looks uh, uh, under as, that they're like, eh, man, they, they don't matter, who cares about them? The Samaritan is the hero. And in the same way, Jesus is kind of like the Samaritan in the sense that during the time of Jesus, in that culture, Jesus 
was not a very uh, popular guy in terms of being super holy by, uh, by the uh, uh, priests and, and Levites and Samaritans because they saw Jesus as kind of like a fool. Because again, Jesus would come in and he would always say, hey, this is what scripture says. Here is what I say. I'm going to raise the bar. Okay, going back to Matthew 5, he says, hey, you've heard it say, love your, uh, love your neighbor, hate your enemies. But I say, love your neighbor and pray for those that make fun of you. Pray for those that, make, that persecute you. But we can see here there are three takeaways that we can take away to use in our own life from this passage of Scripture. The first one being, it's going to be on your notes, the first one being, our neighbors are everyone. Our neighbors are everyone, everyone we come in contact with, all right? For example, is that the neighbor that the the Samaritan saw this person that was left half dead on the road, the Samaritan saw this person as valuable. He saw this person as, uh, as worthy to spend a uh, majority of his day to help this person. Again, that we saw the Samaritan take this wounded person, half dead, put him on his donkey, use all the oil and wine to help his wounds, and then take him to an inn to get healed. So the first takeaway is that our neighbors are everyone. Everyone you come in contact with, uh, someone on Zoom right now. Your next door neighbor is your neighbor, both uh, in a next door way, but also in an everyday manner. Our neighbors are everyone, even the person that we don't normally uh, come in contact with. The second one is our neighbors are the ones that bully us. Our neighbors are the ones that bully us. Now, for example, you may have uh, someone in your mind right now that you're thinking that makes fun of you, that calls you names. Maybe it's over the internet or back in person. Someone that bullies you that really harshly. Our neighbors are the ones that bully us. So we are to love on them. The third one being our neighbors need the love of Jesus. Like it says in verse 37, it says, Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Jesus calls us as Christians, as followers of Jesus, we are to go and love for our neighbor, the ones that uh, we don't really know, the ones that make fun of us, that bully us, We are to share the love of Jesus with them, no matter how they treat us. That's our job as Christians. In 1 John 4.11, it says this, Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Now moving on to verse 19, it says, We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God, yet hates a brother or sister, is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister, whom they have seen physically, who they have physically seen, cannot love God, whom they have not seen. Again, no one has seen God face to face. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. And now we're not just talking about like your actual brother or sister. I'm an only child, so I don't even know what that means. But we're not just talking about that. We're talking about anyone who considers considers themselves a Christian, a follower of Jesus. We're to love on them. But also, we're to love on the people that we normally don't hang out with. Maybe it's that one friend uh, that you are thinking of right now before COVID that would sit in the back of your classroom that wouldn't talk to anyone. Or maybe it's that friend uh, or, or the person in your classroom that is just so loud and annoying. We're supposed to love on them too. But here's the one question I want you guys to take away with this time, and it's going to be in your note sheets as well. Here's the one question. Now, I really want you guys to think about this as you go throughout your week. I want you guys to talk about it maybe with someone on, uh, on Zoom, on FaceTime, Xbox, PlayStation, uh, PC, um, or even your parents, brother, sister, whoever. Here's the one question. Who is someone in your life that you need to show Jesus' love? I'll say it one more time. Who is someone in your life that you need to show Jesus' love? For example, maybe it's a bully, someone that's bullying you. Or maybe it's someone that you're bullying, which is, you know, a little crazy. You need to show Jesus' love. That's our call as Christians. Maybe it's a brother or sister, your parents, aunt, uncle, a cousin, a close friend, or maybe someone you don't know. Who is someone in your life that you need to show the love of Jesus? Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, starting at verse 1, it says this, If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Now what that means is that if you uh, uh, talk in the tongues of men or of angels, in another way of saying if you talk to people, but you don't show love, 
and the way you talk to them, the way you treat them, in God's eyes, you are just an annoying person making just a lot of noise. And God just is like, oh, can, you just, can you just love them and stop just saying crazy words? Stop being so annoying and just show love because Jesus, God, has showed love to us. Now, if there's not anything you get away from this time, this is the one thing I want you guys to take away with. It's going to be in your note sheets. It says this. God cares about everyone, even people that we may not like. Jesus tells us to treat others as we love ourselves. We are called to love one another as Christ has loved us. Oh.